So today, it's uh, indeed a great honor and a privilege uh, to welcome our speaker, uh, Dr. Stamatios Tom Krimigis, who is an emeritus head of the space exploration sector of the John Hopkins Applied Physics Lab. And he is also the chair of science of space at the Academy of, of, of Athens. So this is a big, this is a big deal. I was telling colleagues uh, that uh, how many of us get an opportunity to be invited to White House? You know, <laughs> how many people? And Tom was invited for lunch uh, back in 86, I do believe, and also in 1990 by the two presidents, Reagan and also Bush. So that's a big deal. So let's, let's give him a loud of applause. Welcome him here. Let's give him a loud of applause. And of course, I owe all this to Dr. Laszlo Plus, who made this very possible. So Laszlo, thank you also for bringing me. So Tom comes from a generation that uh, was inspired by the space race during the late 1950s and 1960s. He arrived in the US in 1956, about a year uh, before Sputnik was launched on October 4, 1957. And this was after graduating from high school, thanks to his father, who thought America was modern day Athens. As an undergraduate physics major at the University of Minnesota, uh, he met with James Van Allen, famous for the 1958 discovery of the Earth radiation belt, who offered him a graduate assistantship at the Iowa University after his graduation. He would soon establish himself as a leading scientist of his generation. And in 1968, he moved to John Hopkins Applied Physics Lab, where he spent more than 50 years. Tom's research interests include uh, the Earth environment, its magnetosphere, uh, the sun, uh, the interplanetary medium, and the magnetosphere of the planets. The list of his accomplishments is so long, it's difficult uh, for me to choose what might be considered uh, his greatest achievement. For example, he and colleagues have published more than 600 papers in journals and books. 35 of those papers in science and two in nature. Just to have one paper published in science is a big deal. <laughs> you know, so, that this is so. Let's give him a round of applause. That's a good job, my friend. Good job. Good job. He has won many, many accolades, three time recipients of uh, NASA Exceptional Scientific Achievement Medal. 1981, 86, and 2014. And in 2016, he won the NASA Distinguished Public Service Medal and was honored in 2018 by the US Senate for exceptional contribution to space science. Also, there's an asteroid which is named in his honor, 8323 Climages in 1989. Big deal. The American Geophysical Union, he's a member of American Geophysical Union, American of, uh, a member of the American Association for the Advancement of Science, and the American Institute of Ast Aeronautics and Astronautics. Tom believes there is no limits, no limits of what one can achieve. And his accomplishment, of course, shows this. Today, we are going to hear what excites him about that journey and how they were able to fly an instrument to every planet, every planet, in our solar system. Ladies and gentlemen, please help me welcome our speaker, Samatios Klemegis. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for the generous introduction. And uh, uh, friends, uh, many lifelong friends here in, at Goddard and uh, I'm very happy to have been invited, and thank you, Charles and Lazarus, for making it possible. And uh, I understand that uh, this is kind of a different type of presentation. We're not going to talk about sort of the uh, path-breaking science, uh, one path-breaking science result, but rather cover a lot of ground here. So, so when Charles asked me, uh, to, for a title, uh, Flying an Instrument on Every Planet Ad Hoc. Uh, how to get lucky is uh, kind of the model that I've had 
uh, for, throughout my career. By the way, I never asked you what maniac stands for, um, but I know maniacal is a Greek word, and it means uh, persistent, focused, uh, a little on the, on the uh, difficult side. So I suppose you can say that for somebody who just turned 81 and still working, uh, you have to be a little maniacal, I suppose. So I feel quite at home with your uh, uh, title of your series and, and being here. So uh, anyway, uh, I'd like to uh, begin by reminding us all that uh, way back when uh, we all lucked out when this man uh, flew Explorer 1, Explorer 2, which went in the drink, Explorer 3, Explorer 4, and essentially uh, uh, with his discovery of the uh, and proper interpretation of the response of the detectors, he defined the Van Allen belts, who we all know and love. And uh, he was a big man back when the announcement was made. As you can see, he was uh, on the cover of Time magazine. Uh, and uh, he, he left us in 2006. Uh, and finally, NASA did uh, honor him with the Van Allen probes that were launched in, uh, in August of 2012. And as some of you know who are members of the uh, science team, one of them is uh, being shut down because of radiation damage appropriately from the Van Allen belts. And uh, the next one will probably soon follow. So uh, the, uh, my first uh, mission was that to Mars as a, a year and a half graduate school in Iowa City and Van Allen called me in his office and he said, how would you like to build an instrument for the first mission to Mars? And I said, well, what do I have to do? And he says, what you gotta do is uh, design a detector that will discriminate between ions and electrons. Does a good job because, for those all of you are youngsters in this audience, the initial detectors were Geiger Muller tubes, and a Geiger Muller tube will respond to electrons, to protons, to X rays, to gamma rays, you name it, and you get a count. Then, and the trick was how do you differentiate between the, all these? And I said, I, I don't think I know how to do that. And he said, well, you learn. So that was Van Allen's stitching style. He would just throw you overboard and see if you could swim or not. I finally got this detector working. It was, uh, it was called the TRD, the Trap Radiation Detector. And there was a reason for that. We were going to look for Van Allen radiation belts at Mars. And uh, and this is the rest of the payload, by the way. In the imaging system was the first digital camera ever flown. And I use that slide, that slide sometimes to, for lay audiences because uh, I want to make the point that the space program has always been at the cutting edge of new technology and it pioneered all kinds of things that people consider is our standard today in their everyday life. So anyway, as you know, we didn't find the radiation belts, but I did want to show you this picture. Uh, you say, what are these guys looking at? And looking at the audience, you all think, oh, we're looking at a TV display of data. This is on the day of the encounter of Mars. Well, we ain't looking at a display because there are none at that time. What we're looking at is a strip chart recorder that was rolling between two cylinders and was moving slowly. And then there was a pen that went bing, down, bing, up, 
every time there was a bit at the grand uh, data rate of uh, eight and a third bits per second. That was the rate from Mars in 1965, and, and that was when Alan and I, when I had hair that I could be proud of. Uh, so that was the state of the art. Uh, and you uh, may all have seen in history books about the pictures of Mars by Mariner 4. And, and of course, you know, it, it looked like the moon and everybody said, oh, where are the canals? <laughs> and where's the grass? <laughs> and so on. So he was a pioneer in mission in that sense. He certainly didn't find Van Allen radiation belts associated with Mars. But we were able to, from the null result, we were able to draw some conclusions. And I did want to, so that was my first publication in science, by the way. Uh, we said the foregoing result means that the equatorial surface of magnetic field is less than 200 and perhaps 100 gammas. Uh, right, Zach and Ernie? <laughs> uh, and hence, they suggest that the solar wind on occasion, and perhaps usually, have a direct interaction with the Martian atmosphere. This interaction may be of essential importance in determining the physical state of the atmosphere, all the things that we all talk about today. And also, it is evident that the Martian atmosphere and surface are exposed to the full solar effects of solar and galactic cosmic radiation irrespective of latitude. Well, of course, that's kind of the conventional wisdom today, but this all came from a null result at a distance I think we flew off about 6,000 kilometers away and we deduced the upper limit to the magnetic field. All right, so now uh, I was building instruments at Iowa since uh, 1963, Mariner 4 to Mars, by the way, there is a Mariner 3 as well. And those days, we used to launch two spacecraft because typically one of them didn't work or they uh, went to the drink in the Gulf of Mexico. And Mariner 3 went up. And, uh, and somehow the acceleration, it, it did escape the Earth's gravitational field. But the acceleration wasn't what the prediction curve said. And I was at JPL at the time watching the data from our package. And, and it turned out that the rates for the electrons was about a factor of 10 less. So I called Van Allen and I said, look, uh, it appears to me that somehow we get a shield over the detector. And it turned out eventually that the heat shield have melted over the spacecraft uh, because uh, it was a honeycomb configuration. And you appreciate this. There was a, a, a thermal testing. And it was done separately. The heat testing was done separately from the thermal vacuum test or from the vacuum testing. And what had happened is that the, the uh, air that was trapped in the cells, in the honeycomb cells, when the spacecraft went up, needless to say, got heated, it expanded, and it melted the whole thing over the spacecraft. But the funny thing is that uh, over in those days, you could really change things very quickly. And uh, I don't remember which company it was. Maybe it was TRW. Built another heat shield. And within 28 days, we launched Mariner 4 with a new heat shield. And it worked. So that's what we know. So anyway, uh, I, we built. Um, with Tom Armstrong and uh, Ted Fritz and others, uh, I, I built uh, seven instruments. Actually, if you count Mariner 3, it was eight. In, uh, from 1963 to 1967, 
1967, right? 68, he was injured in five, okay. In five years. Can you imagine going on this many missions in five years and building instruments for those this day and age? I mean, it would take that many years to do the paperwork and the, uh, go through the design reviews and everything. But that, those were the early days of the solar, of the uh, uh, space program. So, but of course the, uh, the historic mission uh, of, I think, is the, uh, the best mission that NASA flew in the 1980s, in the, uh, well, not in the 1980s, in the previous century, in my judgment, has been Voyager 1 and 2. These are the trajectories, and you remember that uh, these encounters with Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune was possible because of the alignment of the outer planets every 175 years. And you can, I have here the uh, acceleration, the speed of the spacecraft. You can see that we launched and it was like 37 kilometers per second. Then of course it dropped because of solar uh, gravity. But then at Jupiter we picked up like 15 kilometers per second just from the gravity assist. And then the same at Saturn, Uranus, Neptune, we went over the pole, so uh, we actually lost some. But the escape velocity was only about seven kilometers per second. And that's why, uh, to this day, Voyager 1 is going out there at 17 kilometers per second, Voyager 2 at about 15, and lo and behold, they're all still working. This is the... Uh, the Voyager spacecraft that you can see at, uh, at JPL, uh, and I'm standing there for scale, uh, it's uh, a pretty remarkable spacecraft, it turned out. All the instruments are out in the booms. This is the, uh, the can that uh, included, well, uh, the, the magnetometer and uh, the, the power supplies. And in terms of uh, that SAR instrument, the one that um, uh, our team built, uh, hanging here, the antenna, of course, always points on the, at, the, at the sun. It's a three-axis oriented spacecraft. As uh, if you want to do planetary observations and take images, that's what you do. And the specs are here. It's about a ton. Right now, we're running at about 260 watts. Um, the transmitter power is about 22 watts. Uh, it has plenty of uh, hydrogen fuel, uh, but on Voyager 2 is about to freeze because of temperature issues. And uh, uh, of course, we communicate at 160 bits per second from a distance of uh, 147 astronomical units. 22 billion kilometers, and, and it's still working. Okay, but I do want to tell you that if you uh, wanted to do angular distributions in a three-axis oriented spacecraft, you really had to do it in your own instrument. And uh, I wanted to show you our solution to that. Uh, this is the, our original team, by the way. And, and this is the instrument. These are the Salas State Detector Telescopes, with, which were bi-directional. And down here, we have, you can't see it, it's a stepper motor. Think about that. Well, most of you can't because you weren't born then. But uh, in the early 70s, having a mechanical device on a space car was thought to be at least crazy, because mechanical devices were always stuck in space. But we really felt that it was very important to, to do the angular distributions. This is where we were. So we needed to scan all around, and of course, except in one direction where the spacecraft boom was. And what we ended up is this scheme where this is the direction of the sun, and 
we, every, we divided this into eight sectors and we moved the, this whole platform about 45 degrees every time and then back again. You might say, how do you do that? Well, I'll show you how. Just for historical reasons. How many of you recognize these things? <laughs> of course, they're capacitors. And, uh, but uh, we had a bank of capacitors to generate a 48 capacitors, 250 microfarads, to trickle, the trickle charge through the spacecraft variable power supply. And it supplied a 15.7 watt for periods from six seconds to 192 seconds. So this, uh, this little device uh, was on the spacecraft all these years. I'll show you, I'll show you how uh, it sounds. That's how it moved. <laughs> this is a this is, scale model of this is Voyager. Voyager. To remember, space it was moving like that. that is presently I was showing it when in we, the process during of flying the, by the uh, planet Neptune Neptune. encounter. But right now, this little gadget has gone eight million steps. This is a so eight million steps, and we designed it to go 250,000 because Voyager, if you remember, was called MJS 77, Mariner Jupiter Saturn. 77, because it was supposed to go to Jupiter and to Saturn in four years, and that would be the end of the mission. And here we are, 42 years, and still going. And this little device, as I said, uh, it keeps rotating now for more than 8 million steps. Uh, uh, I, I tell you, I'm the most amazed of, the, of anybody <laughs> that is still working, and it has done terrific science, and I don't have time to go into that. I just want to show you, although, what was happening in terms of data now. Now, Voyager was a great leap forward in terms of data rate. We were getting 115 kilobits from Jupiter then. There was a big leap between 65 and 77 in data rates. And this just shows, this is George Gleckler, by the way, Ron Zwick, uh, Rob Gold, myself. And, and we were looking at uh, plots of the data during the uh, Jupiter encounter. I just wanted to remind you that we had a hell of a lot of tapes. <laughs> and that was the state of the art. We also had a lot of input from our theorist friends. It was like a party, everybody came in. This is Alex Dessler, many of you recognize him. Lulan Zarabi, uh, Erhard Kurz from the Max Black Institute, who was my postdoc at the time. Vitanis Vasilunas, uh, uh, and Ian Axford. Um, so uh, they were on, on, uh, on the science team, and uh, we had made a bet uh, uh, with Alex Dessler. Alex, as you know, was the magnetic anomaly guy, and he said that as we went by Jupiter, you would get a 10-hour periodicity in the, in the spike in the radiation belts. And I was, uh, I didn't believe that, and I said, no, you were going to get a five-hour periodicity. And of course, we ended up with a five-hour periodicity, and the bet was a bottle of Chivas Rigo. So uh, I, I won the bet from Dessler. Okay, so then, uh, of course, you see this spacecraft. Uh, a member of the audience is there, Nick Pascalidis. He was uh, designed some of the electronics in these instruments. Uh, the uh, the LAMS instrument, which is kind of a, like a Voyager type instrument. But now we had made a big uh, step forward with the charge energy mass spectrometer that George Gleckler and Doug Hamilton had built. And now we could actually measure the charge of a particle. Uh, but the next and, and very important big leap was the ion and neutral camera, INCA. 
as uh, that was essentially the first selected big instrument to do ENAs, energetic neutral atoms. And I uh, will show you this is the suite of instruments. This is the Inca, the main electronic unit, the charge state measurement, and of course, what I said before, was like the Voyager spacecraft, and it also had the stepper motor to give us angular distributions. Unfortunately, that one failed about seven months into the mission in, uh, at Saturn, and uh, so we were stuck in one direction only. But uh, I think the revolution was with, now I want to show you, this is an image of energetic neutral atoms from Saturn's magnetosphere, and this is kind of a schematic that shows the kind of image we got with the Inca instrument. Uh, the UV aurora uh, at Saturn, and uh, you will see down here we have the uh, uh, aurora kilometric radiation, AKR. And I'll show you, we were making movies. We have tens of thousands of movies of plasma motions in the magnetosphere. Down here, you see the intensity of the aurora kilometric radiation. You see there, and you see the brightening of the aurora, and then the corrotation of the, okay, that's the aurora kilometric radiation. That's you here, it goes to maximum, and then it kind of, goes away as the plasma. So this plasma, and we have other movies, usually comes in from local midnight and then rotates to the front side. Sometimes it goes one rotation, sometimes two. So for the first time, it was really possible to do movies of plasma moving in, in a planetary magnetosphere. So, uh, okay, um, it's going on for a while. The uh, next one that we did was the messenger mission to Mercury, an orbiter. Uh, this is the composite image of, uh, of the, with enhanced colors, I should say, uh, that uh, messenger did. And it was a real test of technology because the heat shield facing the sun uh, had to withstand 350 degrees centigrade. And it wasn't clear whether that could be done, but uh, the design worked, and sure enough, uh, we got not one year out of this mission, but actually four years out of the mission until we ran out of fuel to adjust the orbit uh, because it was so close to the sun, it turned out that the, the periapsis was always moving down and we had to fire uh, the on, on, fly, on, uh, on, uh, on board rocket to push up the periapsis until we ran out of fuel. And that happened after four years on the 30th of uh, April of 2015. This is where, this is a real image where we estimate the, the uh, crash was, and this was the altitude profile and where it actually hit. Uh, and we estimated that it uh, produced a crater of uh, like 17 feet wide, de deep, sorry. So on that day, I have this picture, <laughs> there was applause uh, at the control center. Uh, Son Solomon was the PI, by the way, you all know that. And you might say, why are you applauding? Because the crash was behind Mercury, and the whole exercise was to estimate exactly when it would hit. And the trajectory type said, okay, it's gonna hit at such, such a time. And so, if they were wrong, we would get the signal coming out the other side from the spacecraft. Well, the time came to see the signal if it actually missed <laughs> and it didn't come. So that's hence the applause uh, that uh, actually we calculated things correctly or they calculated things correctly. 
And uh, the uh, next spacecraft that I want to say a couple of things about was, of course, the uh, New Horizons that you all know about. Uh, you know, some of the numbers are really impressive that, that you had a 30 kilogram payload in a 470 kilogram. So it's 6.3% of total weight was the payload. And uh, on, on Voyager, I think it was like 10%. Uh, but the, the propulsion system was much smaller than what it was on this. Um, Anyway, uh, as you know, uh, that uh, the encounter occurred nine years later. Uh, and uh, here is a picture I think I was uh, published in the Wall Street Journal. But this is what, what uh, Pluto really looked like. And it, it was a, a great success. But note the date, July 15. 2015, what does that mean? You probably don't remember that I showed you my second slide. July 15, 1965, the first mission to Mars with a camera. So in 50 years, there was, to the day, it was the completion of the investigation of all nine classical planets and uh, Alan Stern and uh, Baldwin and I had the nine-figure salute <laughs> to indicate that it's all done, all nine planets. And I think it's a terrific accomplishment for NASA and the United States to have been able to do that. By the way, don't try this if you ever go to Greece, because it's an obscene gesture, and somebody's going to beat you up. Uh, you can ask the, my compatriots in the audience to tell you about that. And uh, finally, I, I want to show you this uh, one mission um, that uh, is listed here. Somebody did this slide and they put arrows in there because that was the first planetary mission uh, we ever did at APL. And, uh, uh, remember, the, uh, the intent was to orbit Eros, Eros, which we did. But then we ended up landing it. And this is the announcement uh, uh, of the landing. And you can see we had various dignitaries here, the congressmen and senators, Ed Weiler, Dan Gordon here. Uh, this was... Um, this was on February 12th, two days before Valentine's Day. And of course, that was uh, the, uh, the, the thing, the gig that your uh, compatriot and long time Goddard employee, Bob Farquhar, who had come to APL a few years before. And as you know, he was always love, learn, and uh, love, talk. Trying to remember the word. And he thought that it would be terrific to have a landing on Eros very close to Valentine's Day. So that, he, he went out of his way to, 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 to fiddle with the trajectory so that this could actually happen. But the more remarkable part is this. Uh, there was this story in Time Magazine about NASA's cheapest shot. This mission was the first discovery mission. And the discovery program came in at a time when every planetary mission was costing 500 million to a billion. And uh, in one of the workshops, or the planning workshops that uh, NASA headquarters had organized, um, there was a small group that was intending to look at low-cost planetary missions. And I remember Don Hunton, the late Don Hunton from Arizona, who was chairing the session. And he said, look, this is a contradiction in terms. There is no low-cost planetary missions. 
Anybody who says otherwise is crazy. So at that time, we had been working um, at Goddard and at APL to define the ACE mission. You all remember ACE, Advanced Composition Explorer. It, uh, we had just done a phase B. Uh, Ed Strong was the PI. We had really said that you could actually do a spacecraft and a payload with seven or eight instruments for less than $100 million. So I kind of raised my hand and I said, uh, well, you know, it can really be done if you guys begin to think about imitating the Explorer program. Say, so, oh, what's that? You know, the planetary people really didn't know much about the Explorer program, even though that was a workhorse of the agency for God knows how long, ever since its inception. And, um, and I tried to explain, and I said, okay, tomorrow morning you give us a presentation about that. We had just, uh, we had just finished, as I said, the, the phase B study. I called my secretary and she faxed me the view graphs. And the next morning, I made the presentation on how the ASA Explorer office does this for a reasonable cost. And uh, so afterwards, the, the little group decided, yeah, well, maybe we ought to do a working group to define a new program. And afterwards, Jeff Briggs, who was then the head of planetary, came to me and said, hey, uh, listen, can we send about 100K to you guys to really give us a proper study? I said, sure. Uh, so anyway, that's how the discovery missions were established. It was um, essentially adopted by Congress. And we are now on, I think, on the 12th mission in the planetary program. But the most important part was that um, uh, the cost was defined to be $150 million lunch plus 30 days. Remember, Planetary was running at that time on uh, uh, $500 million to a billion. Their latest attempt at the low-cost mission was, I think, the Mars, a, a Mars mission that was supposed to be a low-cost mission, and it had overrun its uh, budget and its time and all this, and it was running well over $500 million. So, so uh, the competition actually, the NASA run was between APL and JPL. And we had a presentation at uh, Caltech and, and we said, yeah, we could do it for 112 million. And uh, the JPL team that came up, uh, uh, when their turn was to make a presentation, uh, and by the way, headquarters had established a, a group of a peer review team that was chaired by Jim Martin. I don't know if how many of you may have met Jim Martin. Jim was the program manager for the Viking missions in the, in the 70s, but then from Langley, and, but he was a pretty tough manager. And uh, so JPR team came up and said, uh, look guys, uh, I know that's what the AO said, you know, but there is nothing worthwhile you can do in planetary 450 million. That's the bottom line, and we'll tell you why. So, so they proceeded to, to show a set of slides where they would um, try a first shot with just a spacecraft. The second one would be uh, with a spacecraft and one instrument. The third one would finally have a camera on it. And this was a program for 450 million over 10 years. And, uh, and Jim Martin, God bless his soul, he passed away, got so mad. <laughs> and he said, you people think we are stupid, don't you? 
and, and really berated them. So the bottom line was that um, despite uh, all of the politics, um, uh, the committee decided unanimously that APR ought to be given a chance to do this mission. And this is a, uh, right after lunch, we actually did the program for 104 million. And we, uh, Goldin and Senator Mikorski came out and we gave them a, uh, a, a refund at the time as a, as a down payment of, for three and a half million. Uh, actually, the program, uh, nobody believed us, even at headquarters, and NASA was actually bookkeeping 150 million. And what they were able to do is to fast forward the, um, the dust, uh, the second discovery mission, which goes to get some dust back from a comet. Uh, Jack, do you remember the name of that? Uh, say that? Yeah. Uh, and so 35 million was forwarded to the, to the next mission and made possible a lot of progress. Uh, I have to tell you, by the way, that uh, once this was publicized, I, I got a lot of hate mail from my friends from various places, including this place, saying, shame on you. Nobody ever used money back to the agency. That's a, uh, that's a bad precedent. Anyway. Personally, the one thing that uh, from my own scientific interest I'm very happy about is this slide, and Jack will relate to that. Uh, to know that uh, we actually know now the magnetic properties of solar system planets, the intrinsic magnetic fields, and their magnetospheres. And uh, this, of course, came from Messenger. Prior to that, it was Mariner 10 but the latest determination is what I'm showing here. And all of this, of course, is from Voyager and eventually subsequent. So uh, at least in my own discipline, I think I, I, did, uh, I did many of the things that I was hoping to do. And now I want to take a fast uh, forward about Voyager to tell you <coughs> about the heliosphere. Uh, many of you remember uh, Parker's book in 1961 about the shape of the heliosphere. And, and he posited two things. One, that it's a magnetosphere-like model. If you have a very uh, weak interstellar magnetic field or a tailless heliosphere, when you have a large interstellar magnetic field. Uh, the entire community adopted this since 1961 without any data. Not a single scintilla of data, of course, from such a distance. And uh, essentially, Voyager 1 and 2 kind of did away with that because, uh, I don't know if Len is here, Len Burlaga. But uh, Voyager 1 measured not 0.2 and 0.3 nanotesla. That was the expected magnetic field. Voyager 1 measured 0.5. Voyager 2, which you will see in another month in Nature Astronomy, is 0.7. What does that mean? I'm not, I'm not going <coughs> to bother with all of this, bother you with all of this. But the ratio of the interstellar magnetic field to the plasma pressure measured by Voyager was two, not 0.05, which meant that really the interstellar magnetic field was the determining factor, not the flow of the interstellar plasma. And we <coughs> codified that in a paper which we, where we used the images of energetic neutral atoms from the heliosith measured by Cassini, mind you, from that same camera that I showed you, we made all the movies, and, and showed that this is more like a bubble. So those of you who still believe in a tail magnetosphere, 
forget that. That's what it's like. And finally, I wanted to show you the, uh, this is from our paper that is supposed to come out in uh, Nature Astronomy. This is Voyager 1 at the heliopause. Voyager 2 at the heliopause from last November. And you can see the terrific similarities, but they are not identical. I mean, you have what looks like a boundary layer of about an AU. In both cases, you have the electrons, the 35, this one 53, 35 is the first channel, that first sense that we're approaching the heliopause, and that happens at Voyager 2 as well, you know, months before the electrons started going down. Uh, the contrast between Voyager 1 and Voyager 2 is that once you cross the heliopause, there's hardly anything outside. This is the solar channel. This is the galactic cosmic rays. I should have said that to begin with. Galactic cosmic rays go up. The solar material goes down. It's as simple as that. That was the... The, uh, the diagnostic, the solar material disappears. A little bit sticks out, but that is also some uh, anomalous cosmic rays. Here at Voyager 2, galactic cosmic rays went up, the solar material took its time to go down. And, and the width of this is like 0.6 AU. Actually, we actually have a signal to about an AU. So there is leakage of particles from the heliosheath into the galactic medium. And the picture that uh, you will see in Nature Astronomy that we put together for our paper is, uh, it summarizes all of this. Now Voyager 1 is at 147 AU, Voyager 2 at 122. Um, and we talk about the boundary layers that exist in both places. They're not exactly the same. And there is plasma flow. Uh, the, uh, the solar apex is out in between Voyager 1 and Voyager 2. Voyager 2 is to the east of Voyager 1. And the plasma flow is into the board, into the tangential flow, into the heliosheath at Voyager 1, but is in the opposite direction at Voyager 2, as one might expect. So um, uh, I'd like to kind of contrast <coughs> the theory versus observation. Some of the modelers, um, Spiro, think that I'm a bad guy because I um, uh, point out the disagreements with theory. So pre-Voyager predictions about the ISMF. This was it. That was a canonical number, hundreds of papers. The actual number, 0 0.5 to 0 0.7. That makes all the difference because don't forget, b squared over 8 pi is the pressure. And the pressure of the interstellar magnetic field dominates. Anomalous cosmic rays. Hundreds of papers were written. Uh, they are accelerated at the termination shock. Where we went, we crossed the termination shock. No spike, nothing. At Voyager 1 and Voyager 2, actually, we have terrific data within the heliosheath. They're accelerated in the heliosheath. Uh, next was about the heat of solar wind dominates pressure in the heliosheath. That's what uh, standard MHD says. Well, it's actually uh, dominated by superthermal ions, not by the heat of solar wind that was shown by the crossing of the termination shock uh, by John Richardson uh, with on Voyager 2, where the plasma works. Galactic cosmic rays are fully isotropic in the local interstellar media. I mean, that's what Fermi said, Fermi acceleration. Remember, it's all isotropic. What did we find? I didn't show you the data, but we found that the, sorry, long-term episodes of reduced galactic cosmic rays perpendicular to B. They're anisotropic. 
The galactic cosmic rays know which way the interstellar magnetic field is pointing. And they are constant in the parallel direction, but they have a decrease in the perpendicular direction. And finally, what I just pointed out here, shape of heliosphere resembles magnetospheres. That's what we knew. We now think that there is a bubble with 120 AU radius. Uh, I remember when we first talked about that, that I, I sent the paper to Jim Parker, and Parker sent me a note, and he said, ah, now I get it. There is nothing like data to really make us think straight. And he says, as I see it, you have the solar system moving through the interstellar magnetic field flux tubes. They surround this like a fist. They surround it, and then it moves to the next flux tube, and it closes behind it. That's what we think is, uh, is the case. Now there is uh, the people who do MHD modeling are not too happy about that because they have terrific investments in MHD modeling with low magnetic fields, and that's a key point. I don't want to get into that. OK, now I want to show you this picture uh, because it's one of our team meetings. Uh, 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 in 2014, when we were still debating about the upstream events, uh, Mike Ruschevich, my successor, is one of your own here. Uh, uh, I did go, and this is our instrument, uh, uh, the flight spare unit, which is sitting there. Um, and uh, these are the PIs, uh, Dan Garnett, uh, Yours truly, Ed Stone, Ronas. As you can see, we're all of a certain age. Uh, 42 years with the same mission. Well, actually, it's closer to 50 because we started out in uh, 1971, is when NASA did the selections. And, and there's only, well, we have two ladies a theorist and another lady who seems to be more determined. See Susan Dodd, she's the program manager. And we all pay a great deal of attention to her because you heard of the, the golden rule. She who has the gold makes the rule. <laughs> That's Susan. So, uh, and finally, I'd like to close with a personal note. Uh, this is a bunch of... Uh, kids uh, with homemade rockets. This is from my hometown on the island of Hills. These are the rockets that you see. Uh, yours truly is here. And uh, what we do is on, uh, on Easter night, when we have a midnight service, is we, we shoot the rockets to the opposite church and try to hit the dome. This is the church that I belong to. And you have a spectacular show. You see thousands of these things crossing for an hour or two. And that's where I kind of learned my first lesson in propulsion. Uh, so with that, um, I want the, the place is this, the island of Hios. Uh, uh, we live uh, at this place. I grew up here. And uh, this is the family house renovated. Uh, and this is the beach about 200 yards away when I go jogging. And this is, uh, this is a tavern. You go eating. And it's uh, not a bad place if you can get there for the summer. So. With that, I wanted to show you this picture and close with that. OK, here we are, my game. So uh, Van Allen, oh, no. <laughs> that was Van Allen and his wife. Uh, on his 90th birthday in Iowa City, uh, Iowa. And uh, right behind him, you will see a lot of the pioneers in uh, the original space.
space science of NASA. A lot of them have passed away. If you look closely, uh, you will see Frank Montano, uh, who actually started in Iowa City. Uh, you will see uh, Carl McLuhan, one of the people that with Van Allen discovered the radiation belts. Uh, George Ludwig, who passed away. So Van Allen, McLuhan, uh, Van Allen, McLuhan, and George Ludwig. Ernie Ray, who passed away a long time ago. He's no longer, of course, here. You see Don Garnett, Ed Stone, Dan Baker, Frank, as I mentioned. But here's Jim Parker, Sue Nakasofu, uh, Lou Lanzarati, Norm Ness, Ed Smith. This is the first time I've seen Ed and Norm next to each other ever. Uh, and so it was quite a gathering. And uh, my, I, I, I was uh, exceptionally lucky to have gone to Iowa City. I was never a member of the proposal team for Mariner 4 and Mariner 5. Van Allen was and asked me to be a co-investigator. And of course, we, uh, uh, we did win the competition on Voyager and so on. So I have never been with an instrument to every planet unless I had gone to Iowa City. And I'm eternally grateful and consider myself exceptionally lucky. So, thank you.